Welcome, everyone. Once again, my name is Todd Rossnagel, Director of Communications for the Louisiana Conference of the United Methodist Church, and welcome to this live webinar with Bishop Cynthia Fierro Harvey and Dr. Uh, Robert Peltier, who is the Chief Medical Officer at North Oaks Hospital in Hammond, Louisiana. Uh, uh, we will have more on both of them coming up, but first, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, just a reminder that this is a webinar. Uh, your cameras and your microphones are off, and that is designed so that we can focus on the content, focus on the content that's coming from our speakers. But we will, of course, be taking your questions. That is the reason why we have gathered together. So please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. Uh, don't use the chat. Uh, we, we, we will monitor the chat, but the Q&A feature is the best way to submit a question. Uh, so please use that. Uh, we are also aware, by the way, that Governor Edwards has called a 1.30 press conference. That'll be uh, starting here momentarily. Um, just so that you know, uh, at home, uh, we are monitoring that press conference. If anything breaks that is worthy of passing along to anyone, uh, we will, of course, pass that news along. Um, but again, uh, as you know, Louisiana has been declared a state of concern by federal officials and Governor Edwards has issued a statewide mask uh, guidance. Everyone, no matter a vaccination, um, is encouraged to wear a mask if uh, social distancing is not possible. So again, we are monitoring that press conference. But we are happy to be here this afternoon to take your questions. We hope you learned something new. Uh, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Dr. Robert Peltier is one of our guests today. He is uh, from the North Oaks Health System in Hammond, Louisiana, in Tangipahoe Parish. He serves as the chief medical officer there. He also serves as a, a chairman of the Louisiana Hospital Association's Chief Medical Officer Roundtable, where his leadership has helped shape best practices for the state's medical response to the COVID-19 global pandemic. And just a footnote, Dr. Peltier was a guest of ours on the Louisiana Now podcast. I think that was back in June. It's funny, I just recently went back to listen to that podcast and it's it's unbelievable how much how much things have changed just uh, since June. Um, and uh, so um, I've gotten to know Dr. Peltier since that podcast recording. And I know that that this setting, this particular setting of, of educating and talking uh, specifically to folks in the faith community is a bit of a calling for him. So we thank him uh, for carving time out of his day to join us. And also Bishop Cynthia Fierro Harvey, who is the resident bishop of the Louisiana area here in Louisiana. Um, she is also, in case you do not know this, uh, in connection with her Episcopal assignment here in Louisiana, she is also currently serving as the president of the Council of Bishops. So with those introductions, I swing it over now to Bishop Harvey for an opening statement and for a prayer. Bishop Harvey, good thank afternoon. You. Thank you, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your Friday afternoon uh, to really listen in on some really important information. I'm especially thankful to Dr. Peltier who takes certainly um, time out of his very busy schedule uh, to spend an hour and a half with us and address some of the difficult questions that we're all facing and to give us an update on uh, where we are. I know there, there are times I was telling Dr. Peltier earlier that I feel like I'm overreacting, but um, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I do sometimes uh, because I, I really believe in, in doing everything that we can to minimize harm uh, to our community. I wanna leave the majority of, a time, of the time to Dr. Peltier. So if you'll allow me now, I'll just open us with the word of prayer. And um, I know we're here to hear you, uh, Dr. Peltier not me. So uh, let's pray. Uh, gracious God, here we are again. But even more importantly, and thankfully, you are here. You've been here. You're still here. And for that, we are grateful. We pray today for all who are impacted by COVID, especially this fourth wave. Families, children, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, co-workers, and the list goes on. We especially pray for the physicians, nurses, chaplains, and all our healthcare workers who are on the front lines every single day. And most especially those who are often forgotten 
those who clean hospital rooms, prepare meals, change sheets. They are so critical to the care of those who suffer. So we especially give thanks for them. We are very thankful today for Dr. Peltier and for the time he gives us. Let us commit once again, oh God, with your help to love our neighbor and to do no harm, to do no harm. Be with our communities, our state, our cities, and all, all who uh, we are entrusted to care for. Protect all of us, oh God. Protect us. For this we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Harvey. Um, we will now, um, if we could, uh, swing it over to Dr. Peltier. Um, and Dr. Peltier, I, uh, I guess one of the best uh, questions maybe to ask to kind of get us started is if you can give us kind of a big picture summary of where we are in Louisiana with cases and with vaccinations. Um, I know we have some submitted questions. We'll get to some of those in just a minute. But um, the floor is yours. Thanks again for joining us. First of all, thank you for having me. And uh, uh, Bishop, your, your prayer there when you said first do no harm, you know, that's the first line of the Hippocratic Oath. And so uh, I guess that touches all the providers here a whole lot. And I appreciate you recognizing because sometimes they're, uh, they, they're not on the top of the list of people thinking, taking care, but our environmental services people, our respiratory therapists, all those people contribute to the care that we can provide here and at all the hospitals throughout all the communities. Um, Todd, unfortunately, your question of uh, where are we in Louisiana, it's, it's just not good right now. We are, I heard yesterday, um, uh, Dr. Agnew in New Orleans on Dr. Cantrell's uh, press conference say that we are the worst in the world, which is pretty close, if not close to true. Uh, I think also people forget when we, we've sort of lost in the numbers, the individuals that this has impacted. In fact, this morning when I was here, I get here, unfortunately, most days around five o'clock to try to figure out which surgeries we can proceed with and which ones we have room for and personnel. Um, I asked one of the nurses, how many cases did she estimate that we've had worldwide in the United States, excuse me, worldwide with COVID, just total number of people that have been positive. Two nurses answered me. One said, uh, I know it's over a million. And the second one said, uh, I think it's around 900,000. And when I told them it was 205 plus million, uh, they, they just kind of looked and didn't believe those numbers. And I, I think we forgot um, that these are all individuals. And when you talk about just in the uh, you know, United States, and we've had 619 and 93 people pass away so far. And that's as of this morning on the Johns Hopkins website. Those are all individuals, mothers, daughters, sons, husbands, kids, you name it. So uh, I... I, I try to never estimate deaths because I want to remind myself all the time that these are all individuals and people. And sometimes when those numbers get so big, we forget it. So uh, what we've seen with this fourth wave has been um, is been something I didn't, it, you know, Todd, you and I spoke just a few weeks ago, you know, six or eight weeks ago. And at that time, I had even taken out the time to do a quick vacation with family. And, um, you know, I, I thought we had seen at least it, it, the, the last of the big waves. We might have a small wave, but I would have never imagined that Delta would have caused the problems that it has. Um, Johns Hopkins has started a new number this past few weeks, which is the 28 days, the past 28 days, keeping the cumulative total of that. And unfortunately, when you look at a number like that, in the past 28 days, 18.5% of all the cases in the U.S. have occurred just in the last 28 days. We've been dealing with this for 19 months. And now we have that percentage. In Tangiboa Parish, where I'm uh, calling from, that number is 26%, 26 plus plus percent of all the cases have just fallen in these last 28 days. Unfortunately, here in Tangipoa Parish, we also had the cases start a little earlier than most other parishes. Uh, have a weekly phone call with the governor, Secretary Phillips, uh, Dr. Cantor, most of the chief medical officers and CEOs throughout the state. 
um, and we we give updates. And uh, I unfortunately uh, had the parish that was second highest in the country uh, of cases of the incidents in in Louisiana, or actually in the in the country. And so um, I, I I was almost predicting what would happen to my my fellow CMOs and their hospitals over the two weeks to come. Um, and uh, seeing those numbers has been um, problematic for us just to uh, to prepare. In February, our highest total was 68 patients uh, at the peak in, inside of our facility. Uh, last Tuesday, we were at 109. Our seven-day average, we've been running 47% higher than our highest peak ever over the past week. And that puts tremendous pressure on our system. And unfortunately, uh, we are not done with rising. Dr. Cantor said on Tuesday, he expects things to rise for at least the next two weeks before we could possibly see a plateau. Um, if you look at the Washington State predictive model, which the White House has used since last January as their model, which is really pretty good for only about the next two weeks. Once you get out further than that, the, the mathematics start to get a little fuzzy. Um, they predict that we will peak in Louisiana because you can drill down all the way to a state. You can't get to parish level, but you can get to state level. They predict that our peak will be August 26th. That's with their August 5th update to their model. Um, they Their projection is that... Um, we will need 3,759 hospital beds then. Uh, to give you an example of this projection, they projected that today we'd be at 2784 and our actual is 2907. So they're a little bit underestimating from August 5th where we would be, we're higher than that. So uh, we certainly are prepared to, you know, um, keep taking on patients as best we can over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we, and every entity is pushing vaccinations. In Louisiana, uh, the total vaccination rate is about uh, 45%. We've got 4.6 million residents in Louisiana, 4.6 plus. Uh, we've had 2.1 that have initiated vaccination and 1.7 that have completed their vaccination. So we certainly have seen a significant increase in the past few weeks with people going to get vaccinated. And and, uh, you know, uh, I've had people ask why the vaccination rate has gone up. Well, if look at the, um, the, the timeline of what happened, vaccinations came out for healthcare workers and for the elderly nursing home patients, et cetera, back in January, February is when we really started distributing those. We also had a peak about then. So we had very, very high demand and we got a lot of shots out. Of course, we had a supply issue at that time. Subsequently, things got better, and all the people that became eligible became your younger people that were healthy. And like everything we do, and probably everybody that I'm looking at right now will shake their head and go, yeah, I put off my dentist appointment, I put off my, uh, my yearly examination with my physician, I put off cleaning the garage. We tend to put things off that don't have to be done today, and subsequently, when we saw another wave, everybody said, uh-oh. I need, and the, the fear came back again. But unfortunately, vaccinations today helped me in the hospital out in about um, six weeks to two months. That's when really it makes an impact. So, um, uh, and, and vaccination does make a difference. We have for the past five or six weeks now been required by uh, the Department of Health to submit our hospitalizations and test results along with the question of whether they've been vaccinated or not. The state knows, of course, they when we vaccinate somebody has to go into a database, a data bank. They just cross reference those two of people that have been uh, tested positive. Um, Ninety percent of the cases are unvaccinated. Ninety one percent of all hospitalizations are unvaccinated and 83 percent of all deaths are unvaccinated. Let me comment on that last number for just a second, 83% of deaths. Remember that the people that got vaccinated in the highest percentage were our elderly. 
In fact, if you look at the graph on the LDH website, with every decade of life, you see an exponential rise in the percentage of people that have been vaccinated. Subsequently, you know, the chronically ill and the older folks, if they eat, get reinfected, even if they've been vaccinated and, you know, those people don't take vaccines very well, and build a good immunity in the first place, as, as you know, historically, um, when they have a small insult, it, it can be devastating. So, you know, that's why we see flu kill the elderly every year. It's not, I, I generally will survive the flu. Most people under the age of 50 and 60 don't have any issues with the flu, but it still kills lots of Americans and worldwide every year. Um, here at North Oaks, I could tell you uh, today, in the last couple of days, we've seen a little bit of a plateau. Um, I have 81 official COVID patients today. I actually have 91 in the hospital, but I have some that have been here more than 20 days. So we take them out of isolation at that time. So on a, a official state uh, website, um, we have to report 81, but I still have 10. And by the way, eight of those are in our intensive care unit and have been for a long time. So you can imagine that's still a resource issue for me and, 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 our, and our staff. Um, what do we had to do at hospitals? And this is true of our hospital as well as every hospital in the state of Louisiana that's dealing with these issues. Um, we stretch staff. That's the first thing we do. Uh, when I get to where stretching staff isn't enough, I start looking at the things that I can do that I don't have to do today. Kind of like getting vaccinated. If I didn't have to do it today, I put it off. I do the same thing here in the hospital. And so I have to reach out to all my surgeons that have cases coming up and ask every single one of them to look at their list of cases coming up in the next few weeks and ask them which ones can be pushed back. Some examples of that might be a female who's had dysmenorrhea, bad bleeding for a number of years and is ready for her hysterectomy. And her not getting the, that hysterectomy is a lot less worrisome to me and that physician than somebody who needs a bypass surgery, for example. So we have to have those decisions on a weekly basis about which surgical procedures we're going to be able to perform. And why do I have to reduce the surgical procedures? Because I've taken, for example, the nurses that work in my operating room, the nurses that work on the same day surgery unit where people come in and deployed them in other areas of the hospital that I need them. Places, by the way, they're not used to working and certainly feel uncomfortable and push their nursing skills to the limit. So, um, you know, we, we've even had to, we've gotten to the point where a couple of weeks ago we had the opportunity, we reached out to the um, state and federal government to ask for help because there are no nurses to be had. Everybody in the country is dealing with this issue. So there's not an excess of pool sort of for hire nurses that we right. usually have during normal times to supplement when we have more patients come in. They just aren't out there. Uh, we were awarded and they came a couple of days ago, United States Public Health Service team, a bunch of commissioned officers, nurses, nurse practitioners. I even got three physicians that are here helping us manage these numbers of patients. And the other thing I would tell you about the numbers of patients we have here is, and this is true of a lot of my um, uh, other fellow sister hospitals and throughout this, the, the area, um, uh, a COVID patient is not a normal patient for us to take care of. The resources that it takes to follow these patients are significantly higher, almost twice as much as a normal patient. So that means if I had the whole place full, I'd need twice the number of staff. So you can imagine we are forced to deliver not the care we want to give and the care right. that every patient deserves, but we are forced to give care that, that is thin. And that whenever we get thin on care, that leads to, we don't call it mistakes, it is if you usually have a nursing ratio of one to four and I'm making you go one to six, just so the patient has an RN, it's harder for them to see that patient over and over and catch the subtleties of a patient change in condition. So um, with all of that, I, you know, I, I wanted everybody to know when they see um, the hospitals and everything on the news about what they are truly experiencing. And because if you drive by this place, it looks like any other day here. 
till you get inside and you get inside uh, actually up on the floor. In fact, when you walk on our front doors, it looks a lot less um, busy than it does on, does on normal days. One reason, because I've got half the visitors in because we don't allow visitors with COVID patients. We just, it's too much worry of risk of spread to the community and to our nurses, which I can't afford to have them out. I already have an average of about 50 to 60 nurses out sick themselves or waiting for tests to come back. Right. So that's just the state of the union. I know I probably took more time than we, we allotted, but hopefully that'll answer some of the other questions that we may get to as we go. So sure, uh, absolutely. I, I want to spend time doing questions. And I do want to say before we start questions, when we do get, I know, Todd, you have some that you're going to ask me and we'll go ahead and answer those. When we get to three questions. Please challenge me with the questions that your parishioners are challenging you with the hard ones. Sure, and I'll sure. give you the best answer that I can. Well, let, let's go ahead and start with um, a question that was just submitted. Um, the, the question is, based on all the data that you just gave us, um, the question is, should we be holding church, uh, you know, live in-person worship? Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a question, you know, we all have different forms of worship that, you know, church will continue, obviously. Um, but what, a, what are your... What are your thoughts on gathering together in a sanctuary for worship on a Sunday morning? Yeah, it's the same thought that I had this week when I was asked to comment on the downtown developments. We have a, a, a night out here called Hot August Night. So, you know, we got football games coming up. We have the same, and the opinion is the same, is that right now with what the hospitals are experiencing, the more we can discourage big group meetings, the better. And so, you know, especially having a, you know, an event like Hot August Nights where people are outdoors having cocktails and walking around during downtown, uh, it, it just, it, it's a setup for uh, a small amount of spread. And I just don't have the bandwidth right now to expand for new cases. And so um, if anybody asked me about a gathering, I would say, if you must have a gathering, you got to modify it some way. You know, certainly Zoom meetings and those kind of things are great ways for people to collaborate, but um, it, it is very difficult. Inside measures are worse than outside measures just because of the environment and being able to spread um, uh, uh, respiratory droplets. Uh, when you're inside a confined area, it makes it a little bit harder to do that, but it's, uh, but I understand it's also August in Louisiana. It's hard <laughs> right. to hold outdoor events. Well, uh, and and so let me let me just you know gameplay this for for us here for for our audience. If you know maybe setting aside worship on a Sunday morning, which is just you know it's open and 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 you know open to anyone. If a staff meeting or a Bible uh, class and everyone is vaccinated. Is it still safe? Is it safe for all vaccinated people? Let's say everybody on staff is vaccinated. Could they still hold in-person gatherings in a small space? Yeah. And, and, and uh, first of all, I'll let you know, I'm not trying to be a, a, no, no, no. It, elusive we get it. of any kind we get it. Yep. of question. Um, it's not about whether it's safe or not safe. It's about safer. And so every there's so many scenarios that we can determine safety. I think there's certainly when people are vaccinated, the risk of them having COVID goes down from 10, they're 10 percent of the cases. Right. So right. Uh, you subsequently are dealing with a smaller amount of people. So it's it's like the incidence in the parish has dropped in that group. If you know that people are vaccinated, it's much less of a risk. Is it absolutely uh, no risk. No. My younger brother is a physician here on staff. He was doing ID consults. He is vaccinated, fully vaccinated back from January. He had to run through a, a week of he got COVID. He was a breakthrough case. But again, it is one in 10 of the cases right now in Louisiana are vaccinated. So that being said, I think if you are going to have gatherings, you should look at whether they are vaccinated or not. That's what you're seeing happening in the New Orleans region. They they want to make sure they if they're going to have some gatherings, let's make it as safe as possible. So now you need to show your vaccine card to right. get into this bar, or restaurant, or gathering of, of any type. Um, there was so something came out recently um, describing um, the, the Delta variant as more contagious than chickenpox. I'm old enough to know 
uh, just from asking my parents when I got the chicken pox vaccine, just how contagious chicken pox was. Um, the, the question was just asked, are the modifications of masking and spacing, um, generally speaking, are they safe for the Delta variant, which has been described to us as even more contagious and can spread faster and quicker than the previous variant, if that makes sense? Yeah, so um, the answer is yes. Um, so um, let, let me give you some numbers. And, and, and first of all, it's not quite chicken pox. Chicken pox is our model that we always use for really contagious. In fact, there's a <laughs> right. famous paper where uh, a young boy goes to see the pediatrician, walks through the waiting room, is escorted straight to the back, and most of the naive kids to chicken pox in the waiting room got chicken pox. Right. I mean, it's right. that contagious. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're talking about massive numbers. The, there's a number we call an R naught. Uh, it's R with a little circle. It's a, a N A U G H T naught, not N O T, uh, which is the infection capability of a particular pathogen. It's estimated that without any mitigation measures, mask, anything like that, that the original alpha variant was about 2.7. What that meant was is that if somebody was going through their normal daily lives, a normal, let's say American, he would be expected to give it to 2.7 other people. Those 2.7 people would give it to 2.7. And so it becomes an expo. I've seen estimates for the Delta variant from five to nine. So that is a different exponent. Here's mathematics that go with that. I don't it, want the mathematics on that. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let me give you a, a, a something that people can wrap their heads around. If it takes about five days from one person to get um, exposed to when they contract, and if they passed it on for three cycles, you basically say three times to the 2.7 exponent, which comes out to a little bit more than 19 people being infected total. If you take that same three and put it to the exponent of just six, you're talking about 729 people. So you're talking about the difference between 19 and 720 people. And that's at an R naught of six. If it's nine, it's gosh, it's it's a whole right, lot. Right. So much, much more infectious. We also see, unfortunately, that it's more virulent. Virulent is defined as how much damage it causes. And so uh, we see on onset that it's about a day earlier that symptoms start with this one. And um, but we still certainly have asymptomatic people with the Delta variant. And uh, I guess more, gosh, even I'm going to use the word depressing is, is what we see in our intensive care unit for the people that get so hypoxic that they're ventilated or on what we call BiPAP, which is a pressure mask that pushes air in without the tube being in. Um, we haven't been able to save very many. Our, our mortality rate when they get to that, just all the measures that we had done with previous waves, just they just don't work quite as well. And uh, unfortunately, my pulmonary critical care doc, uh, you know, I almost went up, I went home and, and had my cry at home, but it was when he pointed to one of the walls of the ICU and said, Rob, there's no way not, not one of those 10 on that side will make it. He said, I think one on the other side would make it. Unbelievable. Um, we have a question here, kind of a follow-up maybe to the, um, oh, go ahead, Bishop Harvey. Yeah, I've I just got a quick question. Just uh, rewind just a little bit, Dr. Sure. Peltier. I'm sorry to interrupt this, but um, nope. so back to the, the meeting room with everybody that's vaccinated. What happens when those, let's just say they're not symptomatic, or I, I think I have a sinus infection. <laughs> and um then I stop at the Circle K and get my usual Diet Coke. And then I go pick up my kids at school. I mean, are we, maybe that's where I, I sound like I'm overreacting. I mean, is, am I painting a science fiction? Uh, some days I feel like I'm in a science fiction novel, by the way. Uh, am I painting a, a picture that's ridiculous or am I painting a picture that's possible? Um, how about a little of both? Um, 
So here's how I'd answer that. First of all, if I'm exposed today, and first of all, I'll let everybody know I had a significant exposure last week. Um, uh, one of our dermatologists here in town, you know, it, it, we, I wear them, my mask all day and I kept having a lesion on my nose that, um, that wouldn't heal. And I thought it was just the metal. But after it took months and it still wasn't finally, you know, despite Band-Aids, I went get it biopsied last week. Um, next day, the dermatologist calls me and says, Rob, I got to let you know, I started coughing today. I went on a religious retreat this past weekend. Uh, one of the, the guy there just called me. He's positive today. And of course, I got him tested and he was positive. And so I knew that I'm not, I wasn't worried about me being contagious that day. Yes, I had a significant exposure. I mean, he's working on my nose, so I'm not wearing anything. And he was wearing a mask. But still, um, I know that even when I contract, if I contract COVID, it's four or five days before I'm going to be a spreader of it. So, you know, a little bit of um, physiology with viruses. First of all, viruses are exceptionally tiny things. It's estimated that... Um, a person at the peak of a COVID uh, infection would have somewhere between one and 100 billion virions, virus particles in their body. By the way, that's less than a milligram of virus if you took it out. I mean, it's a tiny little bit, but you're talking about tiny particles. A virus is a little pot packet of genetic information. In this case, it's RNA. Some viruses are DNA, but this is an RNA virus. Um, and it goes into a susceptible cell what this one likes is uh, the, the uh, mucous membranes. And it basically hijacks your cell machinery to make more little baby viruses. So it, it uses all your uh, ribosomes and your uh, protein, your Golgi bodies that make protein and all these different uh, mechanisms to make little baby viruses that your body sheds. So it's just a little parasitic infection for a better way of of doing, but remember that one. You know, let's say you have you know a couple thousand viruses get in your nose. They have to replicate, and that takes some time. And then they have to replicate, and again, it's an exponential thing. So it's a few days before people are shedding enough virus right. to pass it on. So if I'm in a meeting with a bunch of people that somebody's got a sinus infection, you know, I'm generally not worried about that day bringing it home to my kids. Now, what did I do? I went home when I found out that. This physician called me and said, Rob, I had an exposure. You know, I'm going to go get tested. I said, I immediately, you know, called my wife and said, listen, we're going to we're going to do the thing like we did before when I was first working and we didn't have a clue how it spread. And that's I sleep in one room. She sleeps in the other. And there was no hugs for a week for me and my kids. I tested once just to halfway through at five days just to make sure I didn't turn positive. I did smart things, even though my risk was exceptionally low. So again, everything's about risk reduction. When you have a group of people that are all vaccinated, the chance of one of them having a problem is less than if you mix people that are vaccinated, unvaccinated, certainly a whole lot less than if you mix all unvaccinated people together. We have seen the results of the unvaccinated be a problem here at North Oaks. One of the first ways that we knew Delta was here was when we had a family of four we had a mom, two children, and a husband of one of the children. So a son-in-law of the, of the mom. The, the girls were all in the intensive care unit. The uh, husband was in our intermediate care unit. He had lung cancer and ended up passing away more from the complications of the lung cancer, but he definitely had gotten COVID. And I lost two of the other family members. Hmm. And that was unusual. But what it also kind of showed me is that unvaccinated tend to be with unvaccinated. They tend to be in families. They tend to hang out in same groups. They're like-minded people. And so when you have that, it's a setup for uh, the ease of the virus to spread. Herd immunity is all about, does the, does the virus have an opportunity to go to a new host? If it's in a room with a bunch of vaccinated people, it's a whole lot less percentage than if it's got a mix or all unvaccinated people being naive. And I want to say the word, I like to use the word naive a little bit more uh, immunogenically naive because people that have had COVID previously 
probably have some immunity. We know they have some immunity, but some still break through even with the new variants out there. But they are at much less risk than other people. Still, by the way, I want to make sure in case this, um, that somebody misinterprets this, there still is benefit via study that came out last week that if you have had COVID before, you benefit from vaccination. Right. Uh, you know, the CDC has been talking about that for a while, but now it's it, it, we have uh, data to support that. Dr. Peltier, um, we have um, we're trying to be mindful of our time as well. I, I hope you can stay with us because we're starting to get a lot more questions. Um, but let me get to uh, the effectiveness of masks. We're getting uh, we, we just had one question that was still getting pushback on the effectiveness of masks. Um, what is your advice on the effectiveness of masks? And maybe a follow up to that also is a previous question. If we're socially distanced wearing a mask, can we sing? So if you could maybe answer both of those. Sure. I, so, I know we uh, can, not yeah. can we sing. We Obviously we can, should we is, is more. Well, I, I won't sing because you will definitely say <laughs> that I can't sing. That's, but that's a different um, tone issue. I'm right there with you. So, um, so you have to understand how transmission occurs for most situations. Um, there is a difference between what we call droplet precautions and aerosolized precautions here at the hospital. We have different uh, stops on the door about what that means. And so droplets are the things that as I'm sitting here talking, there's tiny little bits, you know, if you ever in the right light, you see somebody, certainly when you see somebody sneeze with a light to the side of them, you can see this spray that comes out sometimes that can go pretty far, by the way. Um, and and that, that is droplet. And so uh, we have learned with time that some, some viruses, for example, droplet means that if I cough onto my desk, it can sit there for a while. It's not the primary spread of this is via surface contact. It doesn't survive very long. So, you know, we've seen the whole got to clean and do all those things, uh, you know, wash every handle. It's still a smart idea to do, but it's right. not the major transmission. It is being close to someone who's coughing or sneezing. In the hospital, when somebody gets past uh, 15 liters of oxygen or they're on a BiPAP, actually not even a ventilator, we consider them aerosolizing. So what's happening is it's um, almost like those nebulizer treatments. We are fine. We're making it so microscopic that it floats through the air and we could breathe it in. That's when we wear the N95 mask, which is a seal right. around that, that filters the air coming through. This mask that I wear around the hospital most of the day, you guys, everybody wears, or the cloth mask, um, aren't gonna protect you from that. But it, the only way you aerosolize is either you have high flow, but we also know from some substantial um, um, case incidences, including a church where everybody was at, a choir was singing, that when you sing and you vocalize like that, that vibration of your vocal cords can act almost like an aerosolizer. And we feel like that is a way to do it. So that's been the whole yeah. concern about the singing part of it. Sure. sure. Um, and so, you know, being, if you're gonna, you're gonna have some singing, probably open air is your best area. And, and the mask that we wear, you know, is, is really still mostly not for our benefit. This mask is for me walking around in case I call for sneeze and happen to have it as I'm passing somebody or near somebody or speaking with somebody. I can reduce the respiratory droplets that may be coming out of my mask. So I wear this for other people more than myself. So and that that's would, sort of the lowdown on the mask. Sure. And that would lead to a, a question that was also submitted here, um, asking you to speak to the current risks and precautions needed for our unvaccinated children, masks being one of those precautions, right? Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, kids are tough because kids don't like to wear masks. At least I've got teenagers. I've got a 13 and a 16 year old. Um They've gotten used to it. It's amazing what kids can get used to, but try to convince a three-year-old to keep a mask on. Well, 
you know, good luck with herding that cat. That's just not probably not going to happen. So they are in a, you know, a different group and they can't be vaccinated under 12 still is not eligible. We, uh, gosh, I'm, I, I keep hoping that we see those studies come out soon, but so many people are worried about vaccinations that kids that young, we just, we couldn't even enroll that many in studies. It took a while to get the data that we needed. And we wanted to make sure, sure. For sure that at least we had good data on the adults with the initial studies. So uh, that being said, um, you know, kids, if you can get them to wear masks, that's great. The best thing to do is just try to keep them as far as away, away from people. And let me tell you, there's nothing worse than a grandma who wants to hug her kid and can't, or yeah. grandchild, sorry, sure. and can't. I mean, that's, that force, I don't know what stops it. Yep. Um, and by the way, uh, a quote from Governor Edwards in his press conference just now, there is nothing that pr that prevents the next variant from being worse than Delta. So um, that would lead to a question. I think some people are beginning to ask themselves: Is are the are the the unvaccinated leading to Delta? Is there another variant that is potentially brewing as a result of the current state that we're in? Sure. Now. Remember, there's lots of variants right. that are out there. And so let, maybe it helps to explain a little bit why a variant occurs. We talked about the numbers of virions that are out there, billions. Each time something replicates, including our own DNA and cells, we have the chance of a, a poor copy of the replication of our DNA. Most of the time that results in either no changes the next most common thing is that it causes cell death or virus death or inactivity. But when you talk about that many things replicating in a super rare instance, it may just be the genetic change that causes it to itself change into something that could be more contagious, more virulent, uh, able to evade the vaccination because now, you know, we vaccinate towards the spike protein so that if all of a sudden it created a new way of attachment to the cells or changed the spike protein enough that our antibodies wouldn't recognize it, all of those things contribute. Yeah. So, you know, we are really in a race to get people no longer naive to the vaccine. And that can only happen two ways, vaccination or people get sick. So listen, you, you know, there, there's, you, you could, there's arguments sometimes and people go through the mathematics, uh, epidemiologists of, do we go around and just give it to everybody, especially if it's not a, you know, doesn't have dire consequences and we get everybody taken care of so there's, so we can get rid of the vaccine because that's a, sort of yeah. a way of yeah. getting that immunogenesis. Right. Now, nobody wants to do that. Obviously, a lot of people would die if we did that, but the longer we do that, and I think Americans especially need to recognize that this is not an American problem, even though we have bad cases, partly because we interact so much. We have such good transportation. We, 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 we um, our distribution systems are a whole lot better. Subsequently, uh, the rest of the world is way less than 15% vaccinated. And it, you know, when we talk about boosters, which probably upcoming you know, question in, in a little bit. We talk about boosters. I question from a humanitarian standpoint whether we should be getting boosters to get us from 70% protected to 90% protected when the rest of the world's got zero protection and, and we're wasting vaccines and giving them, you know, letting them expire in our freezers because I don't have enough people lining up to get them. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, that, that's yeah. disconcerting as a human. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about vaccinations. Um, and you know, one of the, one of the, the, the first things people will tell unvaccinated persons, if they have questions, uh, the first person they'll say to go and speak to is your doctor. And maybe the second person that they say to go speak to is your pastor. And so we have pastors, you know, in the room today. Um, how do you communicate the importance of vaccinations to some patients who are hesitant? Well, first of all, you know, I've been struggling with um, 
how do you get, there is no unified message, by the way. I've, I've gotten to the point where um, now I answer individual questions because everybody's got a little bit different take on it. I think it's clear that the just using that this is a disease of the unvaccinated is a, is a mistake at this point. Um, we do know that people are vaccinated, uh, are going to get disease and, and die. Some will die, but it's a small percentage. Everything is, that I do is risk reduction. If I prescribe somebody penicillin, I know one out of a million doses of penicillin, somebody's gonna have an anaphylactic reaction to and pass away. But I also know that I'm gonna save a whole lot more lives. It's just risk reduction. So vaccination, I need to give them the science that's out there about the risk of a vaccination versus the risk of getting COVID. Mm. And um, most people make intelligent decisions based off of that. I right. constantly am getting the question of, well, we don't know the long-term effects of COVID. We might find out that getting vaccinated today, that three years from now, we have something problem. I've heard everything. Gosh, I had uh, my, my uh, assistant chief medical officer, Dr. DeCombs, tell me she had a patient today that said, well, you know, I know all this stuff about fertility isn't true, but what I do know is true is that those people, Everybody pregnant now who gets the vaccine, their babies will be infertile. How they could possibly know that, I have no clue because that's 20 years down the line, right? So, um, you know, I, I try to stay with the science. I try to stay with what the risks are for vaccinations um, and put it in perspective of you must look at not just necessarily the long-term negative side effects, but isn't it just as logical to say that Maybe getting vaccinated codes for a protein in my body that's protective for Alzheimer's. I'm making it up, mm. but the logic, the thought experiment of always mo moving towards a negative, which people are risk averse. So it makes sense that we generally move towards a negative connotation uh, of what may happen to me because we're scared. So we, 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 we deflect fear with um, being scared of something. But, you know, the logic of it may not have a problem. We don't know that it have a problem. And I also let them know that in the history of vaccinations that we've had for a few hundred years now, I should say for modern day vaccinations in, in the you know, last hundred years, let's say, right. within three months, we've identified every long-term complication. Hmm. So we are, you know, we, we started doing phase one trials last summer. So we're over a year into that. I would think that we'd start to see some of it. And by no means are vaccinations absolutely safe, even immediately. We know that it causes some myocarditis in, in, in young people, but it is extremely rare and it's taking more lives of children who are unvaccinated from COVID. Hmm. So, you know, people tend to point out small numbers that have bad consequences as a reason, but we must for informed consent, when we make a decision, we must give the alternatives of not getting vaccinated as well. When we consent for surgery, I tell you, here are the things that could happen to you. You could, you know, you could um, have a stroke during surgery. You could, we do that, but it also is my obligation to tell a patient, if you don't have surgery, here are the consequences of not doing that as well. When presented, most people with logical thoughts about vaccinations and going through all of those arguments with them and answering those questions, I find that most people, and I'll never say, I think you should go get vaccinated. I tell them, you need to go and do the decision that's right for you. Make that decision that is best for you and your family. I'm never going to criticize the unvaccinated. I do, we all have our own personal take on what it does to society. And I do think there is a citizenship aspect to getting vaccinated. Pat Tillman runs out, an NFL player, the minute 9-11 occurs to sign up. What happened to that America that people jumped up and took some own personal risk for the greater good? Um, you know, when somebody is giving me an argument of, you know, I, I'm going to be fine, even if I get COVID, I'll make it through that. You know, sometimes I, I, I try to politely as best I can, even though I'm a little bit irked inside, tell them, well, what about the fact you may pass it to somebody who brings it home to their mother 
who, who does have complications from it and passes away, even if she's been vaccinated. That's just, you know, uh, it, it's just self-centered thinking sometimes that people forget about that consequence only relating to how it affects them or their immediate family. Yep. Um, we're getting some questions about um, positive cases, um, whether the, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, and the length of time that you'd spend away. Um, what is what is the time for returning back? Because um, we, we always get a, is it 10 days? Is it a week? Is it five days? What is it different for those who have been vaccinated? Is it different for those who have been, who have not been vaccinated? Okay. So um, a lot of questions in there. So I'm going to break it down. Um, upon exposure, we feel like uh, in general, from the day that you are, are con have contact with somebody who is infected, it's generally about 14 days that somebody is not going to be spreading illness at that time, assuming that they contract. Now remember, the first four or five days, you're generally asymptomatic. So people here, 10 days, I only need to be out 10 days. 10 yeah, days I, for yeah. somebody who gets infected, is having symptoms. Well, now those front four days where they were a carrier, but not quite got to symptomatic stage, plus the 10 days, there's your 14 days. Sure. Now, vaccinated versus unvaccinated is a little bit strange and controversial to me. And it's a little bit different, difficult to understand because it really has to do with what's the incidence in your area. So mm. uh, even at my son's school, my son goes to St. Paul's in Covington. Their, their position they've taken this year, based on what was going on three or four weeks ago, they made that decision. They sent this out to us before this wave started hitting. That vaccinated children and my son, both of my kids are vaccinated. Um, uh, they would not be required to quarantine if they had the exposure. Their policy last year was my child's in school. Um, the guy sitting next to him just came positive for COVID. We take the kids surrounding him. They're all quarantined out. Now that they're vaccinated, they're taking that exception. With this variant, I'm not sure that that is, uh, that I, I have paused with the recommendations uh, sometimes with this variant and how contagious it is. And the fact that we're seeing about 10% of the people that even are vaccinated um, uh, sort of get out of that quarantine. Um, I, you know, I just told you guys, I, I, I had an exposure. I took it upon myself and the way I treated my family at home just to be on the safe side, you know, the governor's recommendations and his mandates and all those things that people consider controversial for some reason, which I, I also fail sometimes to understand, um, you know, that's, that's the, 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 the bar being as low as possible. We, it's going to take all of us to go above and beyond that. You know, whether whether you go to a restaurant or not and sit and eat, whether you're vaccinated or not, um, you know, is a higher risk than if I sat at home with my family. And so um, it, it, this is always going to be about risk aversion. So when you're talking about quarantine or isolation and those kind of things, your general rule is 14 days. There is one exception to that for severely ill people, especially anybody that's been hypoxic. That number is 20 days, 20 days total. Okay. So you're not talking about the groups you're you're mentioning, but for example, our people in the you know that are in the hospital very sick, they have 20 days before they can come out of quarantine. Yeah, good, good to know. Good to know, Dr. Peltier. Let's put you in a church meeting uh, where uh, the group is uh, discussing gathering together. Uh, for worship. What are some other, we just keep getting questions, ad additional med mitigation measures that could be taken or should be taken uh, for worship? Remember, um, you know, we, we've got that moment, you mentioned this briefly on our podcast, you know, we've got that moment where we pass the peace, um, you know, we've got collection plates that are that are taken up. And I know a lot of churches have gone to digital collection plates, texting to give, and um, but we, we still also have the potentiality for uh, in a couple of weeks, or in, in some cases this Sunday, communion. Um, so, so what are some high touch points that we need to be concerned about? Yeah, um, that's a really difficult question to ask, uh, to, to answer in absolutes. But what I will say is, 
the measures that we've learned over the past couple of years, um, modifications of all those measures just contribute to um, less spread. And so I think every individual organization is going to, and every every type of meeting can try to, you know, um, a good friend of mine who works down the road taught me woodwork and Terry Wild. And what he said was, when it comes to safety, the first thing that I do before I push that wood through a machine is I stop and I say, how am I going to hurt myself? I, I, you know, before I turn the machine on, what are the things Oh, I've got a bucket down here. I might trip over that. Oh, this wire over here is in the way. And I would, I would say that maybe the best thing that everybody can do is before they have that meeting, sit down and have a discussion with people that are before they come in the meeting. Listen, here are some of the things we're trying to reduce risk. Please, if you are uh, unvaccinated, we're going to have a, a, a Zoom part of this meeting. We've decided that vaccinated people can sort of come on in. When we get that vaccinated people in here, we want to talk about spreading, make sure everybody spreads. We're going to wash all those kind of things. I think having sort of a, a, of a, of a thought process before something happens that might be dangerous, just like those, those woodworking machines, um, you know, thinking through the process of how can I lower my risk? There, there is a risk versus benefit in all of this. And, you know, I don't know how much benefit I got by not hugging my wife and my kid for an entire week, other than I felt good about maybe not exposing them. But any, it was, it was a measure that I put in place with my family just to be a little bit extra safe. I would take that same idea and apply it to how you each perform your own church services, your meetings, your Sunday school gatherings with the kids, all of those kind of things fall into how we can potentially reduce the numbers of transmissions. Another question that was uh, that was just asked is um, paint for us a picture, and this is kind of going back to what you said earlier. Um, so I apologize, we're kind of pinging back and forth here, but. Um, Paint for us a picture because, you know, some of the some of the numbers that you spoke of about North Oaks being at, I think, um, 47 percent higher than it was at the at the at the peak. Paint for us a picture of the impact of the system collapsing. And, and, and that's a that's a that's a negative word, but collapsing due to the um, to, to COVID running out of oxygen beds and. Um, Paint for us a picture of how that's going to affect other things in our health systems. Uh, gosh, it's a picture I hate to paint because it reminds right. myself of something that can happen. But we and we we've we've worked out these scenarios. We know where things go. Well, first of all, I'd stop after doing this. The do I'd stop being able to provide the services like the person's bypass that I was here this morning, making sure I had a, a surgical intensive care unit bed. I wouldn't have that bed anymore. When we get to stopping all of the next, by the way, the next thing is to cancel all of our clinics so that people aren't able to uh, visit their doctor for their routine visits. And I, cause I'd have to pull those personnel over here to somehow help. The end game that scares all of us is to a crisis, what we call crisis level of care where we're talking about disaster. And that is where we get to very limited resources and we're put in a position of trying to triage who we're going to give treatment to. And that means, you know, one of my duties, I have a, a jacket in my drawer on the other side over here that one of my jobs would be, and, and if I ever get to this, I, I, I would make me emotional even think about getting to pointing to somebody and say, I don't have the resources. I have to let that person pass away. We would get to that level because this person is more likely to survive than this person. And I've got a limited resource where only one of them can have it. And somebody has got to make that decision. And unfortunately that could even have followed to me. So I, I promise you, I have every reason to never get to that kind of level, but it's not, it, it, I don't get to control it here in the hospital. Right. Right. Where the end result of behaviors uh, that occur outside. And that was true before the, the pandemic and, and how people took care and got diabetes or obesity and hypertension or whether they've been vaccinated or not. Well, um, should 
should we be going to the emergency room for non-COVID related emergencies? I mean, obviously yeah. for having a heart attack, we should go, but I mean, um, just hearing what you said about North Oaks makes me very cautious about going to North Oaks for war anything because I don't want to tax the system. Right. No, listen, I, I think we, we would ask that the public, um, you know, it's not the time to come to the emergency department if your elbow has been hurting for three months. Uh, absolutely. Um, but if you need emergency care, listen, I, COVID today represents a, probably about 40% of my census. We still have plenty of people that need help for, they are having chest pain, they are having congestive heart failure exacerbation. The majority of our patients are still in need of care. Yeah. And so, um, although we're stretched thin, we need to make sure, I don't want to get the message out there at all that the emergency department is closed for business. Not a chance. We, we, we're going to make do as best we can when people come in. But I, I would agree with you, it's not the time to come in for routine to use an emergency department. In fact, we, sure. we would highly recommend that they make sure that they're doing their preventative care to try to keep them out of this facility. You know, and even the, uh, the monoclonal antibody infusion that we give as an outpatient, and we haven't talked about that much, it's only benefit that's ever been proven is reduction of hospitalizations. That's why we give it as an outpatient only. It's not authorized for someone that's an inpatient. We only give it to people at the beginning of their disease to provide, try to prevent them from getting inside of our hospital at all or needing our care. Right. So um, that's a very long answer to you. No, question. no, I, yeah. I get it. Um, so let me let me ask a really dumb question, and, and I'll I'll just be the one that asks a dumb question. Um, boosters. We keep hearing about boosters. Is the booster a new RNA vaccination or is it the same vaccination? And if it's the same vaccination, why getting it again? How is that going to do any good? Because otherwise, shouldn't we just get it once a, once a month? I mean, what, what, explain the boosters thing to me. Sure. So... Um... Remember your childhood vaccinations. There's some, a good example is tetanus that you get every, you know, if it's been 10 years since your last tetanus shot and you come in and need stitches, they're giving you a tetanus shot. It's because we know that over time, certain vaccines, certain immunologic responses wane with time. The mRNA booster, the mRNA shots that are out there right now, they are exactly the same shot when you get your second shot. The first shot and the second shot are exactly the same formulation. What's happening is when we do the first shot, we're sort of priming the system. Mm -hmm. Best way to put it. The booster is to not only create more antibody, but really to have the cell mediated um, response. So there's, there's two things there's out there. There's circulating antibodies, which with time drop down. So even if you, if you were vaccinated in January, like I was, I might take my, my antibody tighter from that, and it may be pretty low. But the reason I'm still protected is because I have cellular immunity, meaning that I have some cells that just kind of sit in your bone marrow, sit in your lymph nodes, that when that virus comes out, they're already ready to go. But with time, those things dissipate too. So certain things need boosters. And we can't know until we've had time to see what those results are. And the most important endpoint is not drawing antibody titers or anything like that. The most important thing is to look in the community what is happening to certain groups. Yesterday, last night, the FDA did come out and said booster shots are going to be uh, authorized for immunocompromised patients. Right. I've spent the morning on the phone with my physicians explaining that when you read what the FDA said, is that they're defining right now immunocompromised patient as solid organ transplants, meaning I've had a heart transplant, a lung transplant, or the equivalent. And that's our most immunocompromised people there are. I mean, they have to be because they have a foreign um, organ in their body. So we're trying to get clarification about immunocompromised because in the internal medicine world where I come from, diabetes is an immunocompromised state. Cancer is an immunocompromised state. Anybody with a rheumatologic condition is an immunocompromised state. Being older is an immunocompromised state. 
And so we're waiting for, and they did say that today they should be publishing what that means to give us better guidance about who should get that third booster shot. And it's just to try to keep that prime system sort of going. So you may see, we may see with time that people are going to get a yearly booster or every five years, a coronavirus booster. We'll only know that with time, if that's appropriate or not. Now, the the other question that comes up is, um, you know, uh, boosters with other vaccines. So I got J&J, should I get, those studies are in the works too. We'll know the answer to that in a few months, probably. Um, so I suspect that we'll see, you know, Dr. Fauci and the stuff that's coming out of the CDC is starting to hint that we probably need some type of booster based on the data of how many people are getting sick and ending up in the hospital. There was actually a, a, a paper that came out the last day or two that's not been peer reviewed um, that talked about Pfizer vaccine only being about 43% effective now against the Delta variant and Moderna being about 70%. And so that's caused, you know, that's, that's going to be the, the headline on the news about them being ineffective. If you read that study, 100% of the people did not die. And it was in the 90s percentile of people that avoided hospitalization, which is ultimately the end point that I'm looking for in my, in my business here and trying to keep people out of the hospital and overwhelming our system, I, I want people to stay out of the hospital. If people have a mild cold, well, I think the vaccine's done its job. Right, right, right. Um, let's talk for a brief moment here about testing. Uh, we're getting some questions about self-testing. Um, testing is very different in England than it is in the United States. How is it that we you know, we can develop all of these vaccinations, um, but we haven't been able to really wrap our arms around being able to take a test even at that, at the home level. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, home testing and, uh, I'm going to try to not get too technical in the, in the science that's out there. Um, there's something called pretest probability. Um, that has to be factored into um, how valid the results of tests are. And so um, if I have a 75-year-old male smoker who has a family history of heart disease and I'm putting on a treadmill, his pretest probability is exceptionally high compared to a 17-year-old girl who's having a little bit of discomfort in her chest, who's got no family history and has never smoked or anything like that. It's so rare that somebody like that would have it that even a positive treadmill test is most likely a false positive test. So if you follow that logic, that's the problem with some of the -the over-the-counter home self-test, which by the way, I took one. That's what I took for this past week. I went over to Walmart. There's a test called Binax. It's two tests for 20 bucks. It's a little card. It almost looks like the pregnancy test with the two lines. There's a control line and another line that comes positive. You have it, you rub it up your nose, you put the the drops on it, you close it, you wait 15 minutes, either one line or two line, negative or positive. In someone who's asymptomatic, especially if they're at a time when the incidence is low, that test is almost useless because its it's positive predictive value is so low. And I'm trying not to get too technical and, and, and make everybody confused. In a time, what I can tell you about those tests is a positive test almost, in, with, especially with symptoms, you have it. You have COVID. So that, that, now I have to compare that with a test that I run inside here, which is a polymerase chain reaction, the PCR test, the gold standard. It is copying viral um, RNA, uh, amplifying it. Its technology is so much superior that its sensitivity and specificity are exceptionally high. And so when I get that test back, positive or negative, I know you have it or you don't have it. Right. I'm pretty much, I maybe I got a bad sample, but if, assuming that the sample's okay, I, I know the, the over-the-counter home tests are a little bit more suspicious. That's why you'll see people. That's why Dr. Cantor said, if you've been exposed, test that day. Not that you're going to have it, but you could have been the, uh, you could have been the um, asymptomatic carrier. Right. You didn't know you had it. That's what that first test is about. And then test in five to seven days 
when it would be likely that your viral load would be the highest and your antigen levels would do if you did the self-test at home. Yep. Barring that, if you've been vaccinated, all of those things add up to a exceptionally low risk. You can go about your business. And somebody who is coughing, sneezing, that is unvaccinated, they, on the other hand, are a different category, which is why you get a lot of the confusion about you're vaccinated, you're not vaccinated, quarantine, isolation, all the different recommendations that are out there. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Harvey, I know you have a question for Dr. Peltier. Yes, um, and I, I hope that this one, this one I don't think is as ridiculous as the last one. <laughs> um, I think they're all great questions. I know they're all good questions. No such thing as a bad question. Um, one of the things that we have learned, especially in South Louisiana over time, is that after, for example, after a disaster, uh, you go back Katrina, and now we've got last, last year's experience, that we end up um, several years later, maybe not even years, months, with, um, uh, it seems like an, an over, a, a, a larger amount of people, larger number of people who have heart disease or divorce or mental stress, almost like a, you know, I, I, I see this all the time, especially right now for our, our friends in Southwest Louisiana. Uh, for me here, you know, anytime we have a heavy rain, I get really nervous. Um, what, what would you say to us as a faith community, um, as those who care for people who are in this very high stress time, um, how would you recommend or what would you recommend in our care, our spiritual care uh, for these persons? Yeah, I'll take the example from uh, our trauma team. Our trauma team, we, we have a level two trauma center here, which means that 24 seven, I have a trauma surgeon, a trauma nurse practitioner, a whole team dedicated to uh, somebody who comes in severe trauma. Cause we know that getting to people within the first hour of a trauma their ability to survive exponentially goes up. Those trauma teams have learned uh, that they have to, because of what they experience on a daily basis, uh, they have to stop at least once a month and have a fellow colleague that comes to them to have a sit down to say, I need to know how you're doing. I need to know, no, 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 no. I'm talking about how you feeling inside lately. That was tough. We had a, you know, especially when we have things like, a, you know, a, 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 the three-year-old that drowns in the pool, those kind of things that they are pronouncing dead in our emergency department after they've worked on for three hours trying to revive. And um, it, it is about brotherhood and sisterhood and making sure that everybody recognizes from each other that, uh, this is an exceptionally tough time and we need each other to deal with that. You know, counselors, you guys, you know, pastors are counselors. You know, they, they, they may not have the social degree and have studied, but you guys have studied along those lines too. And they're the people, you are the people that they're going to reach out, but they need more than you. You can't serve your entire population to that detail where you're sitting down with every member of your congregation once a month or in these times to go, how you're doing? I know you, we all do the best for you. You guys are thin too in these, these times, but, you know, encouraging everybody to have a buddy outside of their immediate family, somebody that they can, um, you know, really lay everything out on the table and tell them how they're feeling and, and, um, and have that, um, solitude. I have, I have a, a person here. He, he works down the hall from me. Um, he's our hospital attorney that I go down and we just kind of have, you know, uh, how you doing, how I'm doing, you know, he, he's not experienced. They, they, everybody checks on me. I had, you know, it, it meant so much to have, um, uh, last week, um, a couple of the, um, our service line leaders, uh, called my wife. I didn't know about it. When I got home, they had brought me, but more importantly, my family, um, dinner because they recognized, you know, that I was struggling and, I, and that they were struggling because they had seen so little of me. I'd been working so many hours that it's those kind of things that keep our mental health 
uh, refocused on the problem and recharged. I was good for another week before I started even getting emotional because you just had that high, that, you know, refilling that, that emotional drain that, you know, that uh, the emotions had it drained out of you. You know, you had, you had a boost realizing you're not in this alone. You know, none of us are, and, but it takes effort. It takes active effort to make sure that people know they're not in it alone. Cause that's what we find anxiety gets the best of people when they're dealing with it alone. Well, and as clergy, um, we are in a covenant relationship with one another um, and reaching out to one another and offering whatever care we can, uh, I think is probably as, as important now as it has ever been. And by the way, do no harm. Not only is it part of your, what, Hippocratic, what do you call that oath? That Hippocratic oath. Thank you. I thought that might be it. Um, but it is our founder, John Wesley, um, that is one of our tenants, primary tenants, is to do no harm. So we share that. And to me, that's do no harm, even when it comes to us, right? Um, especially uh, because if we're not, um, if we're not healthy enough, we can't care for other people. So uh, this is for the clergy who are listening in. We've got to offer care for each other um, because um, we've got to be healthy enough to take care of our, our people. Uh, and we can't be if we're not caring for one another. Thank you for that, for, uh, from both of you. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, I, there was a question that was submitted um, Dr. Peltier, um, there is, you know, a lot of people say if I get COVID, uh, I'll go to the hospital and they will, they will treat me. And there are a lot of treatments available. Um, but the question is, isn't it true that the treatments are less tested than the vaccine? They're safe, but less tested. Yeah, sure. Numbers. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the governor's press conference, and actually, I think, uh, may have been just this past week. Days are blurred for me, I'm sorry. Um, you know, he had three physicians and he had uh, Michelle Sutton, our CEO, um, at that press conference. And Dr. Uh, Catherine O'Neill, who's uh, my counterpart at the lake, um, there was a question at the end during the Q&A where somebody talked about the medications because she had mentioned that uh, one of our uh, better medication for people that are starting to sort of spiral downwards is something called Actimra. It's a, that's the brand name of it. Um, it's a, it, it's an immune modulator and we're, we're, we've run out, you know, there's just the supply based on demand has, has gone away. And she had mentioned that and the, the reporter kind of said, well, what are you going to do now? And she he said, well, you got to first understand that most of these medicines have very small studies they showed marginal benefit, but we got nothing else to offer. So we give it steroids, certainly in later disease, that's absolutely been proven to be beneficial. And I think what she said that was most poignant was what we do is we support your system and we hold your hand and we hope you make it. And um, that, that's, a, that's a difficult thing for people to hear. But most of the medications, there's a lot of sensationalized medications out there now. You know, it started back with Plaquenil, hydroquinone, um, that that was out there that people used. And and you know, I, I caution people until we have studies to say what the benefit is, we're only potentially adding risk. So just because there, there's a sure. somebody that said, "Hey, I treated 15 patients and." all of them did well is not a study. I mean, that is a, that is a single person's experience. And so it doesn't give credence to the use of medications. Most of these medications are marginal um, benefits. Listen, I, I last week had uh, our COVID-19 uh, task force, which are my critical care physicians, my trauma surgeons, my infectious disease specialists, my, my uh, internist, um, some of my surgeons, all in a room saying, listen, we, we, there's new data out. We need to create how are we treating things at North Oaks. And even amongst them, there is debate about whether we should even give some of these medications because of the marginal benefit and some of the side effects that occur from it that are we doing, here we go back, doing any harm. You know, first do no harm. And so it is really difficult for us because we're reaching out to anything when we see these people die and people can't understand, why don't you just try it on them? Because I don't know if I'm doing any harm. 
And we, you know, the studies are not there to say it's any better. And sometimes we use it, sometimes we don't. We don't certainly limit those things, but you know, we certainly also dealt with patient patients that have come in toxic on some of the medications that people are giving out there because they read something, they go, they know they can get, but there's one popular medication out there right now that people are getting that you can get at a feed and seed store for animals. It's an antiparasitic and people are going to get it from the feed and seed and taking it incorrectly. We've already had a toxicity. So, um, you know, those things can be dangerous. And uh, so I would, and, and gosh, I hope that particular medication is what some people are touting it to be. That would be great. But until yeah, I get a yeah. study that, that is peer reviewed that says, yes, this shows benefit, I'm not apt to use it. I, you know, my, my head just hurts of going to a feed and seed store and not going to get vaccinated <laughs> um, and trying some sort of um, cocktail of drugs that's not designed for humans and not going to get the vaccination, but that, and, and when that that's comes, an opinion on my part. So I apologize. No, no and listen, I have the same opinion. The, uh, you know, everybody keeps waiting for the FDA for this magical, you know, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. On it. And, um, you know, the fact that the FDA has not done it yet actually makes me feel better about what we're going to hear from them because before they even gave authorization for a vaccine, they have their parameters for no matter what kind of drug it is, a vaccine, doesn't matter if there's a pandemic or, or there's just a medical condition they're trying to treat. There are parameters of the data that they need before they give an EUA. So we think there's, there's some studies that show early benefit. That's enough for us to say, let's try it in a trial. And then we have to gather all that data for us to give approval here are the parameters. They set those parameters months and months ago when they first gave the EUA for full approval. Here's what you're going to need. They got those recently. Now, remember how many vaccines we've given out in the United States? Millions and millions and millions. So there's a lot of data to go through. And if they would, you know, political pressure probably would, have, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, people want that they want that result. They want either it's okay or it's not okay, or it's safe right. or not okay. And if it is not, if it is okay, what's not safe about it so that everybody has the data to say, including me to counsel patients, here's your risk. Right. Here's your risk of COVID right now. That's what I, that's the thing that I'm anticipating from this. You know, the fact that they finally stamp it. I mean, we've had, you know, in Louisiana, we've had millions of doses of vaccines given away. I mean, what, uh, what I quote, 1.7 people are full, million people in the state of Louisiana are fully vaccinated. We have eight, eight serious immediate reactions to it. So I think the question of, you know, if the FDA comes out next week and says, you know, the, the immediate reactions, it's safe, I'd say, you know, you know, we'd all say, well, duh, of course it is safe. You know, we've known that just because people have side effects from this vaccine. I had it, uh, you know, my second, my second dose, I uh, got a little achy. I had a headache for a day, two days after it was gone. Yep. And, you know, that, that's about a third of the people. So to say there is no side effects is not the correct, to say there are no, there's a, not a significant proportion of serious side effects. I think I can confidently say that's a pretty true statement. Well, Dr. Peltier, um, mindful of our, of our time here together. I know it's coming up on the close. Um, uh, we, we do have a few questions that have uh, been submitted here, and I'll try to send you a document with some of those questions so that we can then reach out to them and put those in the show notes of the YouTube page when we post this video online. So thank you to all of you who asked uh, questions. Um, Bishop Harvey, um, I'll, I'll maybe kick it over to you for some final thoughts and, and maybe pray us out. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I am, uh, I, I've actually taken notes here, uh, Dr. Pelty. I'm, I'm kind of geeking out on all of this uh, information for one thing, but also that uh, you've given us such great, great information uh, to share with our people. Um, that is not just us or some um, YouTube video or something that we've seen, um, but that, you know, these are real, these are the facts. And I'm so appreciative of you and for you, your willingness to take time. I cannot imagine what your day is like day in, day out. I, I just can't. 
and uh, you know um, that you have our prayers, definitely have our prayers. And for all of your staff, um, I, I just, uh, it is unimaginable uh, what you are dealing with on an every day, every minute kind of basis and, and the decisions that you have to make and the changes that come probably faster than, than most of us can adapt to. But um, what I'd like to do, Dr. Peltier, if, if I could, is offer a prayer for you uh, and for your staff and hospital workers everywhere. And um, we do this often, and this may, sound, this may be weird to do uh, in this kind of setting, but I'm gonna invite you to reach out a hand um, you know how we, we do this a lot in our settings, but reach out a hand uh, as if you are placing this hand on Dr. Peltier's shoulder and um, asking God uh, for protection uh, for him and for his staff. So let's pray. Most gracious God, um, you are with us. And for that, we are incredibly thankful. Even when days seem dark, when these moments seem like they are insurmountable, uh, we know that you are with us. We know that you are with us. And out of that, we gain courage and strength for the facing of every hour. I just pray right now for Dr. Peltier and the entire staff uh, that he leads. They are facing death and darkness every day. Yet I just pray that even in that, the midst of that darkness, that they feel your presence, that they feel your spirit stirring in their midst. Give them courage to make the decisions that do no harm. Give them, them courage to make the decisions that you would make, for we know that you are the great physician. God, be, be with not only Dr. Peltier's staff, but those that are caring for patients, uh, COVID patients and all patients in hospitals that are stressed right now. Give them grace and give them peace and give them courage and strength today and all of their tomorrows. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Thank you Harvey. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Peltier. Thank you very much. All right, so this uh, this concludes our time together. And um, thanks again, Dr. Peltier. Thanks, Bishop Harvey. And thanks to all of you for joining us. We'll post this entire conversation on our YouTube channel, and we'll share that out on our social media channels as well. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye.